get started. Um, this session is using GitHub Actions for Continuous Deployment. I hope you're in the right place. Um, so let's just go ahead and get started. My name is Jenna Wilson. I am a principal software engineer at DEPT. DEPT is a full-service digital agency with over 30 offices around the world. I believe they're headquartered in Norway. I should have no, remembered that. Um, but they do a ton of technical work that is not Drupal. Um, but I am their Drupal person in the United States. I am very excited about Drupal. I've been working with Drupal since it was Drupal 6 um, back in 2010. I started working with Drupal uh, building websites for nonprofits uh, for free to learn technical skills, and eventually it became my day job. And um, so I'm really happy to be here with people who are, are also interested in Drupal. So thanks for coming to the talk. Uh, there's a link to my GitHub here, um, mostly because that's where there's a repository that I'm going to be pulling some, pi some files from. Um, I'm going to be doing a little bit of live coding, but my brain is not uh, advanced enough to be able to do all, everything live coding in the talk. Um, but that said, um, we're already in good shape today because Pantheon's actually up. I think if, <laughs> if my talk had been any time in the afternoon yesterday, it probably just would have been me standing up here looking sad. So we're already in better shape. Um, so I'll tell you what we're going to do today. Uh, so actually ignore this first bullet because we don't want to initialize a new Drupal site. When I was doing that locally, it was taking way too long. But um, there is a link in these slides so that if you do want to just initialize a bare bone Drupal site um, with DDEV, there's instructions in there. It's very simple to follow. I was a dev desktop person back in the day, which was essentially like three clicks to get from your remote environment um, up to something you could see locally. And for me, DDEV has sort of stepped into that role of making it just about as easy. But uh, it'll take a little bit too much time, so we're going to start with a site that was initialized that way, but has had a few changes made to it. So we're going to create a new GitHub repository. We're going to put it on there. We're going to make a couple changes to that Drupal site so it works with Pantheon. Um, if you're familiar with Drupal hosts, you know they usually need a, a, a specific settings file that sort of tells you things like how to connect to their database. <laughs> um, and so Pantheon needs a few of those um, I want to, I'll call them integration, sure. It needs a few of those uh, integrations added, so we'll go ahead and add those. Then we'll push our site to Pantheon, and we'll do that using GitHub Actions. So we'll talk through all that. And then we'll, at the end of it, we'll verify, which will be um, seeing that when we commit to our main branch in GitHub, we will automatically see those changes appear on Pantheon. Fingers crossed. We'll see. But that's the goal. So a few caveats and disclaimers before I get started. Um, this is the simplest use case. One of the advantages of Pantheon is its um, uh, functionality called multi-dev, which means that whenever you push a new Git branch to Pantheon, they have the ability to build out an entire new Pantheon environment for you using the contents of that branch. It's great for testing. It means that you can really test your code um, in isolation before actually pulling it into all the rest of your code, which is one of the uh, goals of something like continuous integrations and continuous deployment. But here we are keeping it simple. Um, so we are going to have a one-to-one -one match between our GitHub uh, branch, our D GitHub main branch, and our Pantheon development environment. Another caveat is I am not a DevOps person. I'm a Drupal developer. I want to be building Drupal sites and you know, figuring out content architecture and writing custom modules. I don't want to be sitting writing um, shell scripts. That's not something I'm passionate about. So for me, this is a necessary evil. Um, but it also means that uh, when one of the advantages of this is essentially once it's set up, it means that you're not then a blocker to your team because you're the only one running multiple uh, Git repositories in order to push to Pantheon. One of the great things about working with DevOps is in its uh, best scenario, it is set it and forget it. And so that is sort of one of the goals of uh, this to give you some code that you can implement in your system and then hopefully not think about for a while, at least until uh, GitHub changes some of their um, infrastructure. But they don't do that too often. 
another caveat is I'm not a Git expert either. Um, so when I talk through some of these things, you, you may think like, oh, there might be a different or better way to do that. One of the um, things I want to say is that this is a way to do these things. It's not the way. I hope you can uh, listen to sort of something that I've found useful in a few of my projects and take what works for you and is useful to you and leave the rest. So I don't actually want to spend that much time in these slides um, I, because I wanted to do a little bit more live coding. So we will do a little bit of that while, where we'll actually go to Pantheon um, and do some things there. So let's go ahead and start that. So the first thing that we would be doing in Pantheon, we'll come to the Pantheon. This is the Pantheon dashboard. So I'm logged in. This is an account that I've created with just an email address of mine. It's a free account. And you can see I have a personal workspace with zero of two sandbox sites. A sandbox site is essentially the Pantheon free tier, which it doesn't give you a production environment, but it gives you dev and staging. And so that's what we'll go ahead and uh, use here just for that use case of having one GitHub branch uh, going to dev. So this is, the one, uh, this is the one dev site that we'll create. So here we'll go ahead and click create new site. We'll pick Drupal. We'll pick Drupal 10 because it's the latest and the best. And then that's going to take a really long time to run. I'll go ahead and I'm going to try to call this TC Drupal. We'll see if somebody, if it's still available. That's, the, that's our website. I've been using it, but this, but this is the Drupal Pantheon site URL. So it's not connected to like a .com or anything. This is, and so because I've been using it for all the testing, it's still available. So it's deploying. That'll take a little bit. So while we're here in Pantheon, the next thing that we want to do is essentially um, make it so that our GitHub action process can talk to this Pantheon environment. And the way that we'll do that is via an SSH key and via a, um, a Terminus machine token. So while this is generating, which will take a little bit, I'm going to open this uh, same, maybe not the same tab. Yeah, not sites. I'm going to open this in a new tab. I'm going to come to my personal settings. I'm going to come to SSH keys. Um, and then I'm going to add a new key. And so a good practice here is to give that in. Well, there's a couple of good practices here. So since I'm doing this with my personal account, all of the key, the key, the SSH keys that I'm adding here and the Terminus machine token that I'm generating here will both be associated with my account. If we were not doing this the simplest, easiest, cheapest way, you would probably want to have a structure set up so that instead of um, these things being tied to a person's user, you would probably want in Pantheon to create a GitHub user. And so that kind of separates it from the person. So if I stop you know, working on this site or I leave and then they want to deactivate my account, uh, since these things are tied to my account, they would all stop working. So to avoid something like that, you would um, ideally add these SSH keys and machine tokens, or sorry, create them under a uh, specific account that's named and labeled GitHub Actions. That said, we're doing it free and easy and cheap today, so all, it's, all of it's associated with my account. So that means if my account ever went away, uh, the GitHub Actions would also go away. So that's kind of the a little bit of a uh, talk through about there, about that. Um, there are links to how to generate an SSH key locally on your machine that uh, will be in the slide deck, uh, or which essentially just links to this Pantheon radar guide here about generating SSH keys. But I wanted to save a little bit more time, so I went ahead and generated those earlier today and then put them on my desktop. So let's see if I can find one. So I do have it there on my desktop. I called it TC Drupal. RSA, which is both a public and a private key. Um, a little note on that, you want to make sure that when you generate this key, it doesn't have a password. It will ask you if you want to add one. Just hit enter, because if you add one, you will then need a way of uh, giving that password to your GitHub action, and that just makes it more complicated, and it doesn't really add more security, so just don't, don't select a password. So that's kind of how this was generated. So here we want the public key, and I actually just learned a, the pbcopy command for this. 
Although I need to look up which direction to do it because the first time I did this, I definitely did it in the wrong direction and then just wrote a blank file into my file. Or I made, I blanked out my file. Okay. Oops. So this command that I just ran essentially is just copying to my clipboard the contents of the public key that I generated. And now I can copy that into Pantheon. And this is the public key. Save. Um, so I also included in my comment the, the way of passing the parameter to that key generation so that it's named like this. Um, if you were associating it with a GitHub specific user, you, the naming wouldn't be as important. But essentially, this is, a, this is a way that we'll be able to communicate with this Pantheon site through SSH. So while we're here, we'll go ahead and generate a machine token. And this machine token uh, will appear on screen, which is unavoidable, so I will revoke it immediately after this presentation for security reasons. Um, so I'll be a little, a little less cautious about adding that on, but that's something to kind of be aware of. We'll just go ahead and add one. I will call it GitHub Actions. Save. So this, I want to now save somewhere. I would usually put it in a password manager because this is essentially, uh, in, this is important and secret data the way an SSH key is. Um, so you want to treat it like you would a password. But here, I'm just gonna save it to a text file on my desktop. Oops. Put it in your repository. <laughs> That's level 201. We're level 105 here. Okay. So save. All right. I understand. And so for right now, that's all we should need to do on Pantheon. Slack. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. Well, Pantheon has maybe 15 minutes, uh, I think, before we're going to get back to it. Uh, so hopefully it'll be fine by the time we get back there. Um, but so this is essentially what we needed to do on Pantheon. That's getting our Pantheon dev site going. Um, the other thing... Okay, um, so maybe I'll just talk through before we totally leave this. When this is done, which I hope it will complete during this uh, talk, um, it will have an update, and so we'll want to apply that update. Um, that's essentially just updates to the Pantheon infrastructure that um, Pantheon has a something called upstream updates, so essentially when there's uh, Drupal updates and things like that, you can click a button and get them rolled into your Pantheon site. Um, and so they have some code that supports that, that itself gets updates. Um, I'm really scared about this. <laughs> but it's okay. We'll just continue on and cross that bridge when we come to it. Okay. So now that we have gone to Pantheon, prepared Pantheon to the best of our ability at this time. Let's go ahead and um, talk through what makes a good Drupal site uh, or what prepares a Drupal site well for putting it on Pantheon. Um, the first item here is that uh, one of the, nice, pract one of the uh, nice things about building with Composer is that your Git repositories can actually be very small. So um, essentially what Composer does, as I'm sure many or all of you know, um, it's a package manager so that you can say, hey, on my site, I want to use the Drupal module admin toolbar. 
And so one way to do that is you can, you know, manually download a folder with admin toolbar. You can put it in your um, modules, contrib directory, and then you will have admin toolbar. You'll be able to enable it in Drupal and use it on your site. Um, if you have the site set up with, com with Composer, you can add that same module in with Composer and Composer will go in and download it for you and put it in that directory. What that means though is that um, you, because it works the same way on anyone's computer who would be, use, who would be uh, downloading your source code, you don't have to give them the files for admin toolbar. You can say in your Composer file, I want to use admin toolbar and then when somebody downloads your source code, you can run the composer install command and your own computer goes out and fetches admin toolbar and puts it in the right place for your site. Um, that means that when you do the initial git clone, it happens really fast. And so that's essentially something that we've done, we can do here so we can avoid committing the files that composer pulls in. And then as part of our build process, um, you can do a Composer install. We're actually not going to do that today because Pantheon no longer requires a fully built artifact. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that. But um, initializing the Drupal site, one of the, things, one of the nice things to do when you're sort of making this uh, jump anyway is if you haven't structured your site to um, not have your Composer resources living in your source control, that's a nice kind of step to take while you're in here anyway um, doing some things. And so one of the ways to enforce that um, essentially is to have a get ignore that excludes those files. So when I have my admin toolbar module that I like and I run a composer install locally, it's going to download those files and put them in my local environment, which means there's, they're a modified file that by default would show up in my um, modified file list when I do a get status. So to avoid that from happening, um, one of the things I like to do is have a, a very uh, extensive git ignore file that enforces ignoring those, um, those uh, assets. And so we can kind of open and talk through that. And another, um, another item is that because, you, because you're uh, structuring your site like this with Composer, it means that when you download your source control directory or you, you clone your git repository, you can't immediately run that. Composer install then becomes um, mandatory. And so one of, the, one of the things I'm also advocating here is that for anybody who um, is also looking at your site code and working on it with you, you want to have a readme file that explains in very clear detail how to get those files. So how to run Composer install, how to set up a local environment. Um, and that just makes it easier for anyone who uh, comes after you or works with you um, on, these, on these systems. So those are kind of a couple um, principles that I try to keep in mind when I'm setting up a new project and looking at a new project that I want to work through these things. And then the last thing, of course, is to add Drush. Um, I think that's not going to be a controversial statement. <laughs> um, but you just want to make sure you have it because it, you, it's Drush. I think is so integrated to what many of us do that you'd think that doing a standard uh, composer install of Drupal rec core recommended you would get it, but you don't. So you just want to make sure you add it. And the um, the quick start instructions for DDEV that uh, I followed to build the skeleton site we're going to talk through. Uh, do include that, but it's just something to keep in mind if you're not starting from scratch. So these are the instructions that I mentioned that I followed to generate the site we're going to take a look at. Um, DDEV, in case you're not familiar, is a tool that is uh, equivalent to Lando or Doxel. It's a way of uh, using Docker to initialize a local environment without having to talk to Docker. Um, the way I said I'm only reluctantly a DevOps person, I don't want to talk to Docker myself. Um, so these tools, uh, I can talk to these tools and then these tools talk to Docker and then I don't have to speak Docker's language, which I appreciate very much. And <laughs> so uh, DDEV, Lando, they're all, they're all pretty much the same. I just like DDEV. It's, it's got 
it's it's pretty short, DDEV, you know. So not as short as Finn, but that's okay. But anyway, these are the quick these are the quick start instructions I followed to create the site that we're going to look at. I would do this in real time, but doing the initial um, install of core recommended hangs at ninety eight percent for like five minutes, and instead of telling like knock knock jokes to you all to agonizingly pass the time up here, just trust me, I followed these instructions. The um, the one thing I will mention is if you do use some of those other systems like Lando. Um, they can sometimes take your ports and not release them. So um, there's a config file that once you run ddev start and it fails, you can open the ddev hidden directory, open the config file, and just change port 80 and port um, 8080 to something that's not uh, used. If you are smarter than me, you can use a port scanner to identify a uh, open port. If you are more like me, you can just guess numbers randomly until one works. It's gotten you a far way. It's got you a long way. So. <laughs> I'm just doing my best. I'm just doing what I can. So um, the next slide here was essentially just making a couple changes to personalize the site so we could tell it wasn't it wasn't just a Drupal install. And so here's the site that I created. It's called Alice the Palace. That is essentially, so it's, it's got, I think, three changes. I changed the site name from Drush Site Install because when you follow those commands on the DDEV Quick Start, it just, it includes installing Drupal and it uh, gives the site the name Drush Site Install. So I changed it to Alice the Palace. I uploaded this file of this little palace cat and I didn't create any content, but I did add admin toolbar because I do really like that module. Um, it's very important to me to be able to clear all caches with only one click. And so for me, that's uh, one of the first things that I install on the sites that I work on. The other thing that I did is, um, this is using the Olivero contrib theme in Drupal 10. That's one of the defaults here. Um, by default, its desktop version has a sticky menu that follows you as you scroll down the page, and that upsets me as well. So I just enabled the mobile menu at all widths, which makes that stop. And so that is pretty much all I did to this site, although let's go back to the deck. Oh, the last thing I did is I moved the site configuration directory. Um, if you work with the latest and greatest versions of Drupal 8 and beyond, um, you know about config management in files. And so by default, when you do a standard Drupal site install, um, it puts that configuration directory of things like, what's my site name? What color theme is Olivero using? Or like a real theme that you built that you're using. Um, it'll just put that in your files directory. And you do not want your files directory to live in source control ever. Like that, I think that's clear to everybody. Like, your content should live on your content environment. Your uh, code should live with your code. You don't want to overwrite or modify or touch anything in your files um, from your code. So uh, we don't want configuration to stay there, but it uh, ends up there on a standard site install. So the, um, the next thing to do is essentially just update that. So in your settings.php, there's a, um, a parameter called consig config sync directory. You want to uncomment it. I tend to put it as a sibling to the web or doc root directory just so it's at the root of the site. Um, so that is the, the other change that was made to the site. All right, so we have this site. Oh, we should look at the code for it just because that's useful and relevant. And I made my, I did try to make this font smaller, but, or bigger, but apparently I failed, but that's okay. So that should be the code that lives in what I call Drupal My Site. And we can kind of, let's see, Drupal My Site. I'll, I run ddev launch to open that. And yes, that is Alice the Palace. That is the site that I created. So this is the sample site that has those had those changes applied. So now let's go to GitHub. Put it on GitHub. 
So I'll go ahead and create a new repository. I will call it TC Drupal. I will make it public for now. I will create it. And then essentially what we'll do is, is push the contents of this directory to GitHub. So I will copy these here. So what we'll go ahead and do is initialize a Git repository in this directory. We will call the main branch main. That appears to have been successful. We'll add the remote, and so I'll come back to my TC Drupal site to get what the URL is. So we'll see that tcdrupal.get is in there. And then we'll add our files. We'll just go ahead and add everything. Oh, and we see immediately, if I do a get status, oh my god, so many files, way too many files. So that's when we need that get ignore that I mentioned. So I'm going to get reset, reset or restore. Apparently it was, it was reset. Okay. Yeah, I may need you all to remind me of that because we may have to do this a couple times. Okay, so what we want now is we want a get ignore file that gives us a more reasonably sized list of modified files. And so what I'm going to do is just copy that from the repository that I made earlier for this, which is the one that is public on GitHub. which I called Twin Cities Drupal 2023. So I'll just go ahead and copy, get ignore. Oh, right, I need to tell it where to put it, which is here. So now let me try adding again. Okay, that's much better. So I see my settings.php file, I see my config directory, I see my two composer files, I see my get ignore file, and I see the ddev config file, which I could exclude, but I'll just make it a little easier for other people who want to build this. And then what I'll do is go ahead and commit that. Call it first commit. Yep, let's do that. Let's push domain. This is what we did, too many files, we put get ignore in there. All right, so now we've done that, we've pushed, and now we should be able to go back to Drupal, or to GitHub, refresh my new repository, and now I can see my files in there, just the config directory, uh, the website's default, which includes that settings.php, the get ignore, my two composer files. So we're looking good. Um, the next thing that we want to do though is add that readme because if somebody downloads just this repository they're not going to be able to run it or do anything with it unless they have knowledge that i don't want them to have to go find <laughs> so i'll just go ahead and copy a readme site from that same prepared uh, directory i will Ah, oh, thank you. All right, so I'll go ahead and add that readme. Okay. There are too many unreachable loose objects, so I'm just going to run and get brood. And now I'm going to try that commit again. All right. I'm not a Git expert, so I don't understand why that happens. So usually when, it, when weird things like that happen, I just do what the suggestions are at 99% of the time, they just fix everything. It's great. <laughs> what is an unreachable loose object? 
That's a question for the ages, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> All right, so we've committed the README, I think. Yeah, okay. So here's our README file, site name goes here. Um, if this were a real site, I would fill it in, but essentially it's good to have your production URL, it's good to have a little bit about what the website is, um, whatever the Pantheon site short name is. I tend to, I give instructions for how to do a local site setup with DDEV, um, it uses, you all can read this, I won't read it to you. Um, but the other thing it mentions is at the bottom, which is the goal of why we came here, which is how to do deployment to Pantheon via GitHub Actions. So now we have our site in GitHub. And so now what we need is a GitHub Action work Workflow file. Um, so let's go ahead and copy that from that directory. And then we'll open it and take a look at it to see what it's doing. All right. So this is a GitHub action file. It is uh, written in YAML. This one is named Deploy to Pantheon. It has the name Deploy to Pantheon Host. It has on, push, branches, and I've defined main. And essentially what this means is it means when some code is pushed, or it doesn't actually have to be code, it could be anything, anything. When there is a git push to the main branch, this runs. This is not usually something you would need to change if you're just taking this file, but it does mean um, if you wanted to do something like in integrate with multi-dev, you would be editing this part of the file. But we're keeping it super simple. Um, so the, the items that are site specific, so site specific to declare where you're going on Pantheon, there's a variable called Pantheon site, there's a variable called Pantheon site ID, and then there's Pantheon environment, which again is dev. It's unlikely you change that because again, we're doing it very simple here. Um, but if you did want to ex extend or do something where you're pushing to a different environment, you can uh, start by changing this from dev to something else. So what this does, essentially, it, it uses uh, string concatenation to then turn that into what your Pantheon get user, your Pantheon get host name, and your Pantheon port are. I think the port is 2222 for everybody, but like this comment says, it's making some assumptions here about what your URL is. If, there, if your URL is different, you would have to change this, but in the, the weeks that I've been testing this out, my URLs have always followed this format, so I believe yours will as well, but just as an FYI, if you get something like, we don't know what this URL is, you might wanna go into your Pantheon uh, dashboard and confirm that it does look like what it says in this file. So this is, um, so now we're in the meat of the file. That was essentially kind of some setup parameters, uh, environmental variables. And so what this is, is um, it's, what this GitHub action does is it's going to create a virtual machine in the cloud that does its magic. Um, I like this file because all I have to tell it is, hey, give me a Linux server. Like I don't have to give it a Docker configuration file or anything like that. So all I need is a Linux server, really, because I just need to run a couple different shell commands. And so runs on Ubuntu latest, that gives me my Linux server to do stuff. So once we have that server, it essentially just checks out the GitHub repository that we created, and it does this by using another GitHub action. GitHub actions have their own um, repositories that are really great, um, so they can do complex code for you without you having to write it. Uh, so you don't have to go through and like install Git on your repository and use a bunch of variables to figure out what your repository um, URL is. You can just use the action checkout and pass it this parameter that says fetch everything because otherwise it will do like a shallow copy. But you want everything because you want to pass everything onto Pantheon. And so that with fetch depth 
zero tells it to get all of the files that you would run, that you would get just by doing a, a get clone on your local computer. Um, so each of these name named items is another step that then runs. So I validate composer.json just in case um, you know I added a module and then a patch broke or something like that and it wasn't caught locally before I tried to commit. I just go ahead and run composer validate to make sure that the file is um, actually valid. If you want to add more tests, you could do that here as well. Install SSH key is another one of those actions. This is essentially a stand-in for um, <laughs> adding a private key to your local machine so that you can pass it um, over to Pantheon and authenticate with Pantheon. You may see this syntax here that says, you know, mention secrets. And so this is a special environmental variable that we'll go ahead and add because it would be very bad, bad practice to have our terminus tokens and our SSH keys directly in this file because that I think somebody mentioned like put the terminus token in your in your in your Git repository. So you don't want to do that, but you need a way to use it. And so the way that you can use that is by um, GitHub Secrets. So we'll go ahead and we'll do that. Terminus is the same way. There's an install terminus GitHub action. So we use it, we pass it our terminus token, and that's what lets us run Drush commands. I left a, a placeholder here to do any additional cleanup. Sometimes you might um, want to have some files locally but not deployed to the server. So if you wanted to re remove anything, you could do a rm command here. So you want to add the Git repositories that don't host because essentially this needs to run non-interactively. And so um, that message that you get whenever you add a new Git or try to do a Git clone and it's like, do you know this host? And then it tells you this is avoiding that, stopping everything. And then so now we get into the Pantheon specific parts of this. So here we're going ahead, we're going ahead and we're adding that Pantheon URL uh, for, the, for the Pantheon Git repository to this server that we made in the cloud. And then we're gonna push all of our code. I have a force in here. You don't, this is another one of those things where like, I'm not a Git expert, so I know that you probably don't want to do this, but I can't quite explain why. And I know you at least need to do it once because the Pantheon Git repository does not know anything about your GitHub repository. And so in order to essentially tell Pantheon, like, no, this is your repository now, a force accomplishes that. In theory, you would only need to run it once. Um, but if you just want to set it and forget it, you can just leave it in there forever and somebody can tell me at some point why you shouldn't. So that forces the, um, what that does is it forces the Pantheon Git repository to be replaced with what your GitHub main branch repository is. And then this last item is it does terminus drush, drush updates where, um, <laughs> so, pa so Pantheon's dev and staging environments go to sleep if nobody's visited them in, I don't know how long, a couple hours maybe, let's say that. Um, so we wanna wake up the environment and then um, once the environment's awake, we go ahead and run terminus, uh, we run the code rebuild command and that essentially uh, refreshes the code. Um, and so the reason that this command is run is when we do a git commit, there's a, uh, there time elapses before you then see that code in your Pantheon environment. But part of the advantage of continuous deployment is if I have my configuration and I make a configuration change, I want that configuration change to be imported by my site without me having to do it manually. And so um, what the code rebuild does is essentially it does a uh, synchronous instead of asynchronous request to update your environment and not continue the script until the code that you pushed is in that environment. If we didn't do that, it would mean that when we ran that drush command, it wouldn't actually have your updated configuration yet, and it would just say, no config changes found. So 
that's why that's in there, and then that lets us do our terminus drush um, deploy command, which was actually something I learned about during this, during researching this, because I had been doing it where I do a drush clear cache, I do a, um, a database update, and then I do a config import, and then I clear caches again. And you can just run drush deploy, and it does all that, which is something I learned for this, so I was excited about that. And then the last step in this is it uh, runs a, Terminus runs a Pantheon clear cache. And so that's because Pantheon has its own caching. Um, that means that anonymous users might, you know, see the old version of the site even though all the code is, is uh, updated. So it's like if you've worked with Acquia, how you clear caches in Acquia and you clear the varnish cache after you clear the Drupal cache, running this clear cache command for Terminus is basically the same thing. So this is the file. We are running super slow or super late on time, I'm sorry, uh, but I'm going to try to get this done. So let's go ahead and add those secrets. Well, let's add the file. No, let's add the secrets first, because if we add the file, it will try to run and then it will fail because the secrets won't be there. So let's just go ahead and add the secrets and then we'll see if it works. So what I've done is I've come to the settings tab of my new TC Drupal repository. I want to come to the secrets and variables item in the left hand menu, go to actions, new repository secret, and then I want to come back to my readme because it tells me what the variables are named and they must match. So Pantheon SSH private key, copy it, let's see if I can do pv copy again. Is it less than? Yeah, yeah. Oh, thank you. Think of like an arrow that you're putting the RSA into something. All right. Let's see the end of it. We'll add that. And then we already know my terminus. We already know my terminus is not secure, or my my machine token is not secure. So I'm just gonna copy that old school. Put it in here. Yeah, what is the name supposed to be? I'm like panicking, there's so little time left. You're almost there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the support. Okay, we have our secrets. So let's go ahead and try to just directly commit that file and see what happens. It would help, help if I were in that directory. No, oh, it's not gonna work though because we didn't set it up with Pantheon. But we'll push it and then we'll go to Pantheon and see if Pantheon's complete. Okay, Pantheon's complete. Deploying. Yeah. So that's there. So in theory, you want to apply updates here. What I'm going to do, I'm going to import my local database, which I did not create. So we'll go here. Is this in my slides? Oh, man, we're really out of time. What I think we should do is just skip to this TC Drupal directory or this TC Drupal site that I created that you should be able to see. So this is set up with the difference between this and the other site that we saw is this has the Pantheon files that you need in order to get your site working on Pantheon. So it has an upstream configuration, it's got Pantheon YAML files, Pantheon upstream YAML files. So what I'm gonna try to do in the interest of time, I'll give it another five minutes or so, is essentially add these secrets here and see if we can <coughs> deploy this one. So come and add my secrets and variables, actions. Oh, I have these here, but these are almost certainly not accurate because I went deleting everything 
can update. Apparently, you can update secrets. SSH private key. I'm just going to show it on screen and delete it after. I think you can just blame Pantheon for all of this. <laughs> <laughs> I was so taken aback when I saw that status error that all of my timing just kind of went out the window. Okay, so those are our repository secrets. And so the other thing that we need to do is I need to come into this site now, which I'm going to switch to that one. So I need to configure that, um, which is empty, so I cannot see it. I need to configure the GitHub action so it's connected to that site. So I'll come to this workflows, deploy to Pantheon, and so I... Yeah, I called it TC Drupal. Okay. So the other part of it is I need to come to Pantheon and there's essentially like a Pantheon site ID that there's a few different ways to get it. If you um, connect to it and clone Pantheon directly, you'll see this ID. I'm just going to pull it from the URL. It's the same. And then we'll just go ahead and paste. And we'll save. And then we'll see what happens. Push. And so the other thing we need is a database. I don't really know what's going to happen when I try to push the code without a database because it's going to try to import config and it's not going to have it. So what we'll do is start exporting the database here. Oh, because this isn't a site. All right, we'll export it from the other site. We'll just have a Frankenstein here. <laughs> it might not import. But maybe it will. Just because I just because I copied and pasted a lot of these. So anything could happen. There's, a, there's an ID inside of that import file. Okay, so let's just go ahead and import. Well, actually, let's see what happened. Okay, so it needs the install. There's my database. We'll go ahead and import it. That'll take a little bit. Let's see. So I guess I'll just kind of talk through what I was hoping to show in real time. Here are the changes that um, actually no. So to get the site ready for Pantheon, you have a couple different options. You can merge the Pantheon repo onto your GitHub repo. You can merge your GitHub repo into the Pantheon repo or you can manually apply the changes. Obviously, manual, uh, manual, manually applying the changes means you know what the changes are. I've listed them out for you. That's only current as of right now, uh, September. Well, actually, I can't even say it's current of right for right now because it's not working. <laughs> it worked yesterday. It was current as of yesterday. It's probably still current for today. 
Um, this, the speaker notes in this have instructions about specifically like how to apply these changes. One of them is a directory, a couple of them are just files, and you can essentially get them just by cloning that Pantheon repository after you create it and apply those updates. Um, and then once you do that, you want to verify locally that the site still functions just because any changes to settings.php can break things. When you push to Pantheon, you want to import your backed up database and any files, which we're trying to do here. I'll go ahead and look at it again. All right, I guess my copied and pasted is not terrible. So we do not have the file because I only imported the database. You generally want to do both. So the one thing I think I will just try is I'm going to come to my TC Drupal site locally. That is not the right site. I cannot do that locally. Okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to old school edit the config. So I'm in the wrong directory. So this is my GitHub Actions folder. This is the one that we, in theory, ha are de deploying to Pantheon. Although I don't actually... Because I think you changed the secret, so that would work. Let's see. So let, we're not looking at TC Drupal now. We're going to look at Twin Cities Drupal. <laughs> and then I will just go ahead and look at this action. Okay, change the site ID. Let's see. Committed the action file. So we we'll look, can look at the deploy and see what happened. And... Whoever said the config wouldn't match gets the gets the um, gets the prize. So yes, that is our that is our problem. But actually, that's a lot further than I would have expected. Let's all, see. All the block IDs changed. No, it's just the system that set. So, <laughs> all right, well, thank you all for uh, seeing my attempt at live coding. Um, so yes, in theory, we, we would be working with the same two sites, we would have our databases um, working, so our verification step failed. Um, but we did see everything running. It did connect to Pantheon. So uh, you can look at this repository, hold these files down, in theory follow these steps with, give yourself more than an hour. <laughs> is, that, is that the GitHub Actions debugger you were looking at? Yeah. Um, so GitHub Actions essentially just shows you all of the things it's doing as it's doing them. So if you come to your repository and then click on actions here at the top, it shows you all your workflow runs. So this is just deployment to Pantheon host. There's only one action in here, but you can actually do any number of actions. And then when it gives you that red X to say, no, it didn't work, you can go ahead and click on that and then click on the action that didn't work. And then you can see all of the logging because essentially when you, when you run a GitHub action, you're creating a virtual machine that's a Linux box that's doing stuff. And so Linux is very verbose about kind of telling you what it's doing. So it's great to be able to come to this area and, and troubleshoot because um, yeah. you have all those logs. And you're able to verify what went wrong. Yes, exactly, exactly. So that's how we know that the config mismatch is what sounds, has failed. Sounds like a win. <laughs> Good job under pressure. <laughs> Yeah, I'm like very sweaty right now. <laughs> um, okay, so test and verify. In theory, you would then be able to commit a change to this repository and you would see it appear in Pantheon. That's not going to happen for us today, unfortunately. Um, but you, as somebody mentioned, you can follow the, prog the progress on GitHub's repository actions. And then that's also a great way to troubleshoot. Um, so yeah, if we have more time, we could troubleshoot more. And then opportunities beyond, you could do multi-dev, you can add in testing, 
You can add in front-end ASIC compilation if you're still using SAS. I saw a presentation that said you don't necessarily have to, but then they mentioned another post-processor um, as an alternative to SAS, so you could do that. Um, and then if you do not have Pantheon as your host, you can do something similar with um, Acquia, where Acquia has its own Git repository. It has a different URL for it, obviously. But if you push your GitHub repository to that Acquia URL, you will see similar, I would say similar results, but we didn't have great results today. Um, it will operate similarly, so with those same caveats. So, so sorry for our, uh, our experience that we couldn't see this working end to end, but thank you for taking this journey with me and even giving me 10 extra minutes uh, to struggle through this. And thanks very much for coming. Thank you.